But Harris was given one thing to do in four years back in 2021, go down and fix the border, Kamala. Every American should understand that in Roxbury, Massachusetts, young black children were put out of their rec center to house illegal aliens. At the same time that you've got illegal aliens living in hotels with American veterans homeless, sleeping on the sidewalks in front of the hotels. All right, guys, uh, we've made it through the hump of the week. Peter Navarro is going to join us in a minute. He's got 100 recommendations for Trump's second term. I'm going to break it down with him. This ties in nicely to a big story about Project 2025. You've probably heard Kamala Harris and Joe Biden relentlessly attack what it is. Well, I've got some updates on that, and I want to explain to you what's going on because I, I think that it's, it's more than just a talking point. There's a lot of substance there, and I, I have a interesting, I think, take on why we shouldn't be so dismissive of it. Um, and then I've got some intel on who she's picking and also an update on the debate on debates because now she thinks she can just slide in. So a lot to get to with her and then Peter Navarro. Uh, really great discussion. As you know, the guy just got out of prison four months for defying the subpoena of a ridiculous made up committee. I'm sorry. I mean, think about all these people who defy subpoenas and they send this guy to jail for four months and no one cares. I, I just, it is unbelievable. And, and I'm going to ask Peter about what that was like. Plus what he wants to still, his case is still going forward. They sent him to jail before the appeal. I mean, this is crazy. Like what's going on. And I know no one on the left in the media cares because it's Trump and Trump people, but like, this is crazy how this thing went down. And I want to ask him about that because this gets back to what President Trump says all the time. They're coming after me because they want to come after you. All right. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you about one of our great sponsors who I've loved. Um, you guys know I've talked to you before. I've got at least one bad knee. Uh, I've been in physical therapy for that. Then I've got two horrible hips these days and a shoulder and all this. But I still love to go out for walks and I don't call it running. It's more like jogging at best. And one of the things that I have found is the the gravity to fire shoes that I wear. This is the one that I wear for walking and training, going to the gym and stuff like this. You can see the sole. Like this is this is no no joke, right? It's got this Verso technology in the sole, which is like what they make trampolines out of. It's unbelievable. It's so cushiony, but it also the way that they set the whole thing up. Uh, improves your posture. I feel so much different when I walk in a pair of these versus another pair of sneakers. Uh, and they've got ones that are just for training. They've got running ones and they even have sandals, but it's unbelievable what it does. And they come with these custom orthotics in the box. Uh, I love these things. So cushion, so much support. Uh, and if you go to G D E F Y gravity to fire, but it's G D E F Y.com uh, and use code Spicer 30, you get $30 off your purchase of $150. So it's gdefy.com and then use code SPICER30 to get um, $30 off your purchase. I'm telling you, you will feel the difference and you will not go back to another pair of shoes, another brand, once you try your Gravity to Fire shoes. All right. Um, I want to get into the issues that I mentioned before we get Peter Navarro in here. Um, I'm going to go backwards because I want to talk about Project 2025 in a minute because I think that leads into what Peter is talking about. So a couple of quick things. I've got some intel on who Kamala Harris is picking. Number one, she says she's going to have a rally next Tuesday. Okay, so let's look at the timeline. We know that that means between now and Tuesday. If I had to guess, I'm going to guess over the weekend. She wants to get this in now. They, the, I don't know the Olympic schedule because I'm not really watching that much. But this is the interesting thing about how they've done this whole deal now because they, they didn't think this was going to be an issue. Remember when it was Biden, they thought they'd have a ticket. Now they've got to figure out how do we get – this into the bloodstream when everyone's focused on the Olympics. And when I say everyone, I know I'm not watching the Olympics, but at least the ratings are pretty high. And so they've got to figure that out. My guess is over the weekend. And then I think they have to probably figure it out depending on um, what sports are playing and how to get some kind of news in here. I would guess Saturday. I don't know, maybe Sunday afternoon, try to make it happen, but they got to do it in a way that's happening. Now, they're going to have this first big event in Philadelphia. If you look historically, it's never mattered where people have kicked off. Like when Mitt Romney chose Paul Ryan, they did it down um, in the Hampton Roads area in Virginia, right? It's not 
people are trying to correlate. Maybe that means something. I still think it's going to be Josh Shapiro. Now, here's why. This is the other piece of intel that's interesting. The SEC, the Securities um, uh, Commission there, right? They have a rule about giving money to sitting governors or state officials. So once Shapiro comes on board, it makes it a lot more difficult for them to get certain donations from people in those industries. So if you are in the financial sector, uh, which I think they believe they have a lot of these donors, it prohibits them from making a donation. So they're trying to tell them right now, the Harris campaign is saying, give us money now. That to me is another tell that it's a governor. And if you're going to pick governors, I still think that Shapiro is the smartest one. All the other negatives aside, I still think Shapiro gets you the best chance of getting the 19 electoral votes from Pennsylvania. Okay, that's that. I do want to talk a little bit about debates real quick uh, because the Harris campaign and the media is trying to say that he's backing out of debates. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. You guys pushed your guy aside. The deal was with Biden. Trump understood why it made sense to move up the debates and agree to him with Biden. So I'm sorry, this is like a job applicant. If I turn down the job and the next guy walks in and says, okay, I know you just offered him, I want to take those terms. It's not how it works. You made a deal with Joe Biden and his campaign. They pushed the guy out. Kamala doesn't get to be the person. This is what she said at her rally last night. You may have noticed. So last week you may have seen he pulled out of the debate in September he had previously agreed to. So, so, so here's the thing. Here, here's the funny thing about that. Here's the funny thing about that. So he won't debate, but he and his running mate sure seem to have a lot to say about me. First of all, he didn't pull out of it. He made a deal with Joe Biden. They pushed the guy aside. Now they're like, he pulled out of what debate? You weren't part of that. You were the VP. I, this is insane. And the media is going along with him. But let's just be clear. He didn't pull out of anything. I still think he debates her. But until she becomes the nominee, why would he debate her? The way this party operates, who knows what's going to happen between now and August, uh, whatever it is, 19th, when they have their, their thing. They may throw her aside again. Smart on Trump. And by the way, renegotiate the terms. Why would you go back on ABC, which is completely in the tank for Harris now? Anyway, I want to get to Peter Navarro in a second. Before I do that, though, I want to make sure I tell you about what's going on with Project 2025. This, let's just dial this back for a second. Project 2025 is a group of conservative groups, primarily led by the Heritage Foundation, okay? And they were getting together a bunch of experts, a lot of people from Trump world, by the way, to say, give us flesh out, let's put some meat on the bone and some policies that we could hand over to the next administration. As it evolved, it became obvious it was gonna be the Trump administration. And therefore you have a running start. All it is is a menu. It's like going into a restaurant. It doesn't mean that you're gonna order the burger versus the chicken. It just means here are your options. They were basically saying, we will go through these policies with people that you know, and maybe some people that you don't know. And we're gonna put this big booklet, pamphlet, website, who knows how they're gonna ultimately lay it out, of all these positions and policies. And then you get to pick for them. They're still you, you get to, maybe you tweak them. And we're gonna to put together some policy. And they weren't the only ones doing that. America First Policy Institute was doing similar stuff. And they were gathering resumes and vetting people so that Trump could pick people, not the high level people, the secretaries and the deputy secretaries, but the people at the Schedule C level, those three, 4,000 people that, that presidents can pick to fill their, their administration with. That's what this is all about. Didn't mean you have to pick them. Didn't mean they were getting a job. It just meant, hey, we've taken a look at this person. They're not a complete you know, leftist. They might be complete, whatever. I don't know. I'm not part of this. I don't know what their criteria was. But it at least gets people one look. Now, I get the criticism. President Trump didn't like the idea of them portraying it as if this was going to be his policies. 
I don't know that they entirely did that. I didn't see, but I think some of them. So they put out a statement, the Trump campaign, and it says this, President Trump's campaign has been very clear for over a year that Project 2025 had nothing to do with the campaign, did not speak for the campaign, and should not be associated with the campaign or the president in any way. Reports of Project 2025's demise would be greatly welcome and should serve it as a notice to anyone or any group trying to misrepresent their influence with President Trump and his campaign. It will not end for me. Well, this all comes on the heels of the executive director. I think that's his name, title. Stepped down and moved aside. The Heritage Foundation said he had pretty much wrapped up his work and blah, 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 blah. I get it. Politically, President Trump doesn't want to get saddled with all their policies. Neither should the Biden campaign. Well, maybe they should with the Center for American Progress or the Brookings Institute or whatever. But this is what our outside think tanks do. They gather ideas and advice and hand them over to us. Anyway, I get it. It was becoming a political liability, but okay, we, we've set our piece. Let's move on. But it's pretty clear President Trump doesn't own them. Peter Navarro is going to comment on that in just a moment. So I want to get his take on this because I think it's important. Uh, before I do that, I want to tell you about my friends because we never know when anything's going to happen. We've seen that, oh my gosh, over the last couple of years, right? The last couple of months, rather, and the last couple of weeks unexpected crazy stuff happens all the time, which is why, at least for me, I feel secure knowing I've got a Patriot Power Generator 2000X in my house. And if you go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer, you can have one too. The coolest thing about this is, well, actually, there's a lot of cool things about the Patriot Power Generator. I've had a regular generator, a gas one. When the power goes out, you have to worry, do you have gas? Is it good gas? Because gas goes bad. Then you have to worry, can you refill it? Because if you've done this before, I have. You have to constantly refill it. You got to hope that the gas station is close by, that it's open, right? They only last a few hours. With the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, it runs off solar panels that come free with it. And you can power for hours on end the most important things your refrigerator, your TV, your computers, your tablets, medical devices. It's portable. You can bring it in your house, no fumes, no noise. It's awesome. And you can help out with somebody else who might be in need, a family member, a friend. But the Patriot Power Generator will come in so importantly in a time of emergency. So if you want to feel secure, get that Patriot Power Generator 2000X and the free solar panels that come with it by going to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. All right, it is now my honor to bring Peter Navarro in. He is the author of the new MAGA deal, lays out the MAGA agenda that he thinks is important to President Trump in a second term. Plus he was the former trade and economic advisor to President Trump in that first term. And if I have anything to guess about this, I think he'll be back in a second term. I'll ask him about that. Without further ado, Peter Navarro. Peter, welcome to the show. It's good to see you, my man. Brother Spicer, man, we, we've gone through a lot together uh, back in the day in the White House. and uh, Oh, previously, and I remember, I mean, you know, when we talk about the 2016 campaign yeah. and I describe what was going on there, it was like, I don't know, what were there, 20 people in that war room? You had a standing desk set up with yeah. boxes. I mean, it was this was the quintessential startup campaign. I always get a kick out of all the people who, you know, came in October, November, and suddenly it's like, dude, I remember when. Yeah, that uh, that was an interesting experience. Uh, the day after the election, you know, Ryan and Katie come walking in from the RNC <laughs> and take over the whole place and... You know, but but that's not going to happen again. Um, what we need to do is win this election. And once we win this election, not Trump's first rodeo. Um, basically, the, the, I'm here to talk about the book. So I'll put it out on the table, the new MAGA deal, newmagadeal.com. But it's 100 actions in 100 days that we want to want to hit. And uh, we've had four years of this Harris Biden thing. And. Everything they touch turns to like stone. It's like terrible economy, border security, foreign policy, crime in the cities, weaponization of our justice system. And this woke world they live in, men and women sports, uh, instead of combat readiness at the Pentagon, they're doing DEI. I mean, Trump's America, we were safe, prosperous and secure. In this America, it's it's sketchy, let us say. Yeah, I want to get into a lot of this. So you wrote the book, obviously, before Biden jumped out. I mean, that uh, goes without saying. In your mind, does anything change in terms of the recommendations you lay out in the book because she is the candidate versus Biden? 
Well, the new MAGA deal doesn't doesn't presume that Joe Biden's going to be necessarily the nominee. I mean, I, I said back in January, Sean, uh, that he would not be. I, look, I, we've been played. We've been played like a, like fools, I think, because you could see all of this happening. In January, I said that Biden would stay in to avoid uh, a contested primary where you'd have a bunch of woke radical candidates trying to outwoke and out radical each other, which would make it difficult for whoever emerged from that to run as a centrist, which I'll try to do in the general. Right. So we knew they were going to do that. The only question was whether Biden was going to step down voluntarily or whether they'd have to cut his legs out from under him. And I thought it was clinical the way they did it. I mean, as a guy who has dealt a lot with the press, as press secretary on down, I mean, it's like, okay, so time to get rid of Joe. So let CNN and MSNBC take the lead. And then you bring in the Hollywood, the Clooney's. And then you bring in the politicians themselves. <laughs> they just buried Biden like Biden <laughs> buried Bernie Sanders uh, during the 2020. That was clinical, right? And I, I wasn't, I didn't think that, that Harris would emerge at the top, but the realities of the fact that they raised all this money and she controls it, I think basically was the, the defining factor. And now we got, a race on our hands when we always, Sean, we always had a race on our hands because it's five states, 500,000 vote differential um, in a 50-50 country. So let me ask you this, though. In, in, in the book, you lay out, I think, some fairly common sense solutions to the border. Frankly, it's it's a lot of just doing what, what Trump was doing. I mean, impose a total naval embargo on cartels, order the Department of Defense to inflict maximum damage on cartels, designate yeah. cartels as foreign. Let me ask you, this is what I don't get, okay? When you talk about the border, we always talk about how every state has become a border state, yes. whether that's because of the labor issues, the crime issues, the fentanyl issues, the potential terrorist issues, okay? Yeah. Why in your mind, walk up to any person in America now and say, are you concerned about the following? Fentanyl, crime, terrorism, whatever. I would say nine out of 10 are like, I'm very concerned. And the 10th is just nuts. That being said, why, why is this such a tough sell? Meaning Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have done nothing but brag about undoing the Trump policies on a safe border. And yet they don't seem to pay the consequences, Peter. Yeah. Well, remember that we're not running against Harris and Biden. We're running against CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's who where they're running against. And so they're, they're already putting out the spin today. I mean, Harris is giving a speech and she's blaming Trump for killing the border deal on the Hill. That was nothing about securing the border. It was just a big amnesty bill. But the way they spin it, it's like Trump was opposed to securing the border. I mean, this is the noise that we have to deal with. The one thing that, that Harris should have hanging around her neck like three anchors for an aircraft carrier all the way to November is this, Sean. She was given one thing to do in four years. This is kind of interesting. Uh, Pence was given a bunch of stuff to do. Harris was given one thing to do in four years back in 2021, go down and fix the border, Kamala. She goes down there, sticks her nose up in the air, smells that stench coming across the Rio Grande and says, not my job. Uh, Turns tail, gets in Air Force Two, heads back to the West Wing, and 8 million, 10 million, we don't even know how many million people follow her in, all illegal. There's murderers, rapists, you got drug cartels, you got sex traffickers, you got Islamic terrorists, Chinese spies, and millions. But, millions. Then that's, but, but, but that's, okay, that's my point. Why, with all the bad that's happening, why are we, I get, I agree with you 100% yeah. on the MSNBC and the CNNs and the New York Times, right? They yeah. cover it up. 
But why, why can't we, this to me should be such an easy sell. This is the America they want. This is the security that Trump provided. I, I believe that the polls show now that border security and inflation are running neck and neck as the two most salient issues. So the underlying thesis here is that Americans don't care as much about it. We got double digit leads on this. I mean, look, it's our job. And the only way we can do it is through the conservative and independent media um, to continually remind people that Harris was given that job. She didn't do it. We've got crises. And yeah, every for me, the, for me, every American should understand that in Roxbury, Massachusetts, right? Roxbury in right in Boston, right? Young black children were put out of their rec center to house illegal aliens. At the same time that you've got illegal aliens living in hotels with American veterans homeless sleeping on the sidewalks in front of the hotels. I mean, this is this is what campaigns are about. And look, my my preaching in a secular way with the new MAGA deal book, Sean, is that we beat them on policy. We know what they're going to do. You're 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 just sophisticated as they get on this. It's orange man bad, abortion, abortion, abortion. Throw in a little diversity and gender politics. That's their campaign. And we beat them on every salient issue in the polls. And it's our job to run on policy and not be sucked into that vortex like Romney was by Obama in 2012 on a social issue campaign. And this okay, is so, so, so that, being, that being said, Peter, and just so we're clear, I agree with you. Like, I think the more that we not just campaign on policy, but on record, look at what Trump yeah. did on the economy, on immigration, on foreign policy. Look at what the difference is with three and a half years of, of Biden and Harris. We're on the same page. I think a lot of people on our team, though, want to talk a lot about personality, right? And what is your advice to them when it comes to how do we make the yeah. case that Harris is is bad for the country and her policies will destroy the country? You, well, first of all, I, in 1992, I ran for mayor in San Diego. I don't know if you know this. Of course I, won, I do. I won the primary, narrowly lost the election. Why, why do I bring that up? I was running against a woman. And you cannot run against a woman the same way you run against a man. And the best way to attack Kamala Harris is not with the, the slut critique and, and some of that stuff, but simply point out where she stands on policy and what she has and has not done. Border security is, is the big thing. In Pennsylvania, I, uh, no fracking in Pennsylvania. She did made the same mistake Hillary did. It's like, let them go transition to be programmers or something like that. <laughs> I mean, come on. The, the, there's so much we can wrap around her neck, the, her lack of foreign policy experience. I mean, she's a very objectionable person, personality-wise who rose up in California politics for all of the usual sleazy reasons, they, going back to Willie Brown, who was the icon in California of sleazy politics. But we don't need to go there. What, where, where, and, and we need women to go at Harris. We don't, need, we, we don't need white Republican older men attacking the character of Kamala Harris. Right. That, we, we need a diversity of voices. I mean, one of the things I was on a, a podcast the other day with a with a Democrat woman who's seen kind of the conservative light. I'm saying, you know, how do how do we do this? And she was praising the RNC lineup at the convention for all of the working women who spoke on President Trump's behalf. I mean, we need to see more of them out there on the campaign trail, talking about what it means to be in Trump's America, 
to, 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 to have jobs and, and talk about his own humanity. I mean, Sean, you and I both know how warm and funny uh, Donald Trump is and how nice he is to people who have to shower after work, not before. And that message needs to be gotten out by people who are deplorables. I, lot, we need women on the campaign trail for him, more women. So it's going to be a tough race because we know what they're going to do. And it's funny. If you're going to pick a vice president, it's, it's either going to be Kelly to get try to nail down Arizona or Shapiro to nail down Pennsylvania. And the Shapiro thing's interesting to me because here's a, a, a devout Jew, Josh Shapiro, and he's going to team up with Kamala Harris, who, I mean, her, her policies towards Israel, same as Obama was, I mean, you, it's like, it, it borderline anti-Semitism. I mean, she's like she's like the squad on on Palestine and Gaza and all that. And you know, it's like, but it's going to be tough. So we just need to campaign on policy, and we need to, we need to have diverse voices doing it. It can't just be white guys in the Senate kind of standing up for Donald Trump. It's got to yeah. be all of the people who he's really helped. I agree. Now, let me ask you this. You lay out all these policies in, in the book. Uh, yeah. Did you run them by President Trump or are you just because of your relationship with him, because of your longevity in the White House, you kind of knew this is where he, he was, where he was, yeah. or are you recommending them to him? Where, where does this fall in terms of uh, Trump's head? So the, the process, um, if I can coin a term from the Philadelphia 76ers. The process was pretty simple. Um, the speeches, right? The website has both policy positions, but it's also got a lot of videos, plus the experience working in the White House and the knowledge of what he left unfinished in the first term. So that's the compilation. And um, that's where the 100 actions in 100 days. And, and the way that works, Sean, it's like for people who don't know how, how the White House works and where power comes from, sure, there will be legislation passed that Trump will sign that he will propose and Congress will dispose. But most of the things that a president does is done through executive order and presidential memorandum. So if Trump wins... On November 5th, starting on November 6th, there'll be 100 executive orders written to promote the Trump agenda and 50 more to undo the executive orders Biden wrote. And they'll go through the process, which will include a uh, element at the Department of Justice that's set off from the Biden-Harris regime, and he'll hit the ground running. And so we know. But did you did you talk to him? I mean, does has he no, seen? No, 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 no. We we don't. I if, I never talk about whether I talk to the what I talk about with the president. No, this this is based on the process. It's website speeches, policy positions, prior knowledge from the administration, and leveraging the that knowledge from the people who contributed the Rust vote. And has he seen? Has he seen the book since though? Since it's been published. Yeah, of course. Yeah, he's got. I mean, well, I, look, I say that because look, if you look at the back of it, he, he talks about uh, things, and um, I mean, there's, there's. Uh, I would venture to say there's nothing in there that's inconsistent with his website and the policies that he's going to move forward. Okay, which is which is very different from. Project 2025, for example, which is that's why I want. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, yeah. I want. I'm glad you went there. Yeah, yeah, because I, I was on a I was on a religious show the other the other day, and he came up with this beautiful scripture: how you have to know what the real thing is in order to know what the counterfeit is, right? And the real thing right. is the new MAGA deal. Um, and there's a funny story with with the Project 2025 thing, where 
where they come to me and, and it's like, hey, write a chapter, write the chapter, <laughs> the chapter on Trump trade policy. I go, fine. And then what they wind up doing is they bring in some some free market, free trade guy to write a chapter as well. And so that's the struggle that the Heritage Foundation continues to have. They put a guy at the top. I'll just give you the inside baseball. They put a guy at the top to run the thing. He's trying to make changes and and be reflective of, 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 of Trump policy. He's trying to move Heritage. But the reality, Sean, is heritage can't bite the hand that feeds them. And the hand that feeds them are the woke globalist corporations who love to offshore jobs, open up our border, and they hate Donald Trump. So it's a it's a Trojan horse. Project 2025 is a Trojan horse for the rhinos. And plus it's got some really extreme stuff in it as well. So the I you know I I President Trump has disavowed it. Uh, from the beginning, I've said that both the Heritage and the America First Policy Institute um, are corrupted by rhino infiltration. I, and there it is. How, how many, I mean, what forces, it? Trump gets into a second term. How concerned are you about the forces within government trying to stop him from implementing this agenda based on what they saw last time and what he tried to get through? <laughs> that's Sean, you know, that's the eternal battle. But I think that um, the, the, the experience in the first administration equips him well to make sure he has the right personnel at the top. Uh, there's the, the, the deep state is real. The deep administrative state is real. But if you have good personnel leading all of the agencies and departments, pulling in the same direction, you can easily overcome the deep administrative state. It's only when you put like people like Tillerson and Mattis and have Kelly run it. What's that? Would you go back in a second term? Not, not my uh, intention. In 2016, I didn't help the president to get a job. I mean, I'm no, 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 no. I, I, not that I know you're not getting a job. I mean, you, you don't want, but you, you obviously you've got this agenda that you lay out in the book. I would I, assume that you sure. want to help implement it. I, I don't even think about that. I, I think those thoughts are dangerous for a lot of reasons. I think that. Okay, but let's as, just. just yeah, let me finish for- thought. Me as a single individual uh, at the margin wouldn't make, make the kind of difference we need. What we need is over a thousand people in there who are pulling in the same direction. So that's more of my concern. Um, and that's what I'm focused on. It's, it's, you know, personnel is policy. That's Nixon. Bad personnel is bad policy is bad policy. So, so then we need, we need all those people vetted, right? I mean, I think that that one of the things right. that some of these outside groups are doing is getting a list of personnel yeah, ready see, that understand the agenda. That's important, right? Well, but that's part of the Trojan horse thing, because what they do is they slip, slip in their people with Trump people. And so, I, I think um, I think we need to do what Reince unfortunately did uh, when he came in. I, look, I love Reince. He saw the light eventually. But when he came in, he was not our friend. OK. And and what he did, and I remember this clearly, is like we had spent a lot of time. Martin Silverstein was leading that effort, uh, betting possible um Trump appointees. And we had a, a really good, solid list. First thing Reince did um, from the RNC was throw throw it in the trash and then bring in a lot of his people. And, and that's when chaos got it in, ensued. So I, you know, it, we, we the, the, the Trump campaign does not need any personnel files from the Heritage Foundation or from the America First Policy Institute, full stop. Okay. It's just, they don't need those. OK, right, well, I, I, and, and it's easy enough to uh, we know. I mean, look, for example, in the new MAGA deal. OK, think about this. There's there's at least 10 chapters there written by people who were in the administration or who are, are Trump friendly. We, we know Rick Rennell is going to play a key role. So, right. Uh, we, we know that we know that that Russ Vaught um, will be back. I mean, I love Russ Vaught. He's he, he he's like yeah. he was at OMB after 
the failed experiment of Mick Mulvaney. Um, so, uh, look, Dave Bernhardt writes a chapter. Who's he? He was the Department of um, Interior Secretary. Interior. I mean, he's great. I, I, I would imagine he he would be back. Okay, there's other people out there, you know, Holman and Mark Morgan and things like that. So there's there's people out there. It's just a question of of um, winning the election first. Okay. And, and I, the only reason to talk about who might be in the administration is if it provides the appropriate signals to the American people that we'll be able to do as the Trump will be able to do as an administration, what needs to be done. Right. I imagine Kevin Hassett will be back on the economy. Oh, yeah. He's great. Tyler Goodspeed will be back on the economy. And, and, and so it goes. And there's going to be people who won't be back full stop. Peter, before I, before I let you go, I got to ask you one question that you write about in the book, because this is yeah. important, I think, for people to understand. You write that the Department of Justice itself for more than 50 years has maintained a policy that senior White House advisors and, quote, all, all, all to alter egos of the president, as we yeah. are called, absolutely cannot be compelled to testify before Congress. The DOJ has maintained this policy across you know, several administrations. Uh if I win the constitutional separation of powers, this is you talking about your case will Correct. be preserved. And if America wins, if I lose going forward in the in time, partisan congresses will forever shower the White House with subpoenas, harass political opponents and hamstring the effect. One, I didn't realize the historical perspective that you write about in the book. But secondly, can you just explain to viewers why this is the fascinating thing? Yeah, I agree with you. This committee was ridiculous. This January 6th committee. I mean, we don't have time to go into re how nuts this was. They didn't give the minority their say. It was a setup it, since the yeah. word jump when Nancy Pelosi. We'll talk about that at some other time. That being said, you went to jail for four months while all these other people defy subpoenas. I want you to talk about just as briefly as you can what the goal like you're still fighting this you want to take it to the supreme court Correct. why are you doing this and what's the status well i would say the the ultimate injustice that was done to me after a string of injustices was to deny my release pending appeal in other words after i was found guilty after a judge a democrat appointed judge stripped me of every defense and sent me to a woke district of cannabis jury, the new mile high city, what should have happened is I should have been released while my case moved up the chain first to the appeals court and then the Supreme Court because of the substantial issues involved. And the, the issues are simply, does Congress have the authority to subpoena senior presidential advisors and alter egos of the president like me? What's a proper invocation of executive privilege uh, look like? And does Congress have the burden of accommodating the process so it doesn't lead to prison for an aid? Meaning that one of the things I repeatedly said was, hey, happy to talk to you. All you have to do is go to the president and get the privilege waived and it's done. And they never did that. So the context here, Sean, is you, you go back to George Washington on the floor uh, of, of the House of Representatives talking about something called the Jay Treaty. And what Washington said was, I can't command you, a member of Congress, to come to the White House. You can't command me to go to Capitol Hill. Okay, that was the doctrine of executive privilege. Fast forward to the numerous cases in the Supreme Court as to why executive privilege matters. And it boils down to simply candor and confidentiality. As the Supreme Court has repeatedly said, a president and his advisors need candor and confidentiality between and among them in order to be able to make the best possible decisions for the American people. And that's right. why executive privilege matters. And when you, when, you, when you destroy that, as they're trying to do in my case, the constitutional separation of powers is shattered. So that's the big stakes involved. And John, look, I was one of only three people in the White House to survive from the campaign to the end. <laughs> 29, 29, yeah, I mean, it's if you had this uh, the, the TV show Survivor, the political version, I I want to compete in that. I think I might I might do well in that. But 
but I, I think um, the point is that 2019 was really interesting because Pelosi gets control of the House of Representatives for the Democrats and the subpoenas start flying, right? It's McGahn, it's Kellyanne Conway, uh, Rob uh, Porter, Rick Porter. Dearborn, Hope Hicks, right? And in every case, President invoked executive privilege and the Department of Justice itself wrote letters to the Congress saying that presidential aides have absolute testimony and immunity once the privilege is invoked and you can't you can't force them or compel them to testify. And that that was that's what happened. There was no charges of contempt or whatever. So I I read all those cases avidly uh, and I followed that call because these people were my friends, right? And so once once Trump leaves office and the J6 committee starts issuing subpoenas, it's the same movie all over again. They're sending subpoenas to Bannon, they're sending them to Meadows, to Cash Patel, um, to Scavino, uh, on down the list. And again, executive privilege is invoked. So when it comes to my subpoena coming, I'm like, okay, my duty, according to Department of Justice policy, my oath of officers requires me to defend the Constitution. The Department of Justice requires me to do my duty. So that's what I'm doing. I'm standing up for principle. I have no regrets about that, even though they put me in prison, because if we allow them Democrats to weaponize the justice system, destroy executive privilege, the constitutional separation of powers. As I said in the new MAGA deal, it's just going to be a game. Every time one party holds holds the power, they'll su throw subpoenas at the other party and people will start going to prison or they'll live on their knees. And the American people will suffer because we'll have bad policy decisions made as a result of that. So that's where we stand. And the sad part here is because I was forced to go to prison before my appeal is heard. If I win that appeal, good for America, but I'll have lost four, four months of my freedom. So don't cry for me, Argentina. I love Yeah, You add that line in the book. Don't cry for me. Real quick, Peter, I, I don't want to take you any longer. Are, was it okay? Were you, were you treated okay? I just, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's I, you, I, you, you need to look. 75 years old, no country for old men. Uh, it, it, it was a dangerous place uh, for different reasons. But uh, the inmates respected me for my for the reason why I got there. They viewed me as a stand-up guy. The, the guards and prison officials respected me because folks in Trump land respect the uniform. And while I was there, I, I think I've made the place a better place. Um, I'm going to talk about that after the election in terms of some of the things. I mean, there's a $5 billion scandal I've written about already that the Democrats have perpetrated in our prison system, which is causing the crime rate to go up. I'll leave it at that. Uh, but I think the Democrats are going to regret putting in, me in there because they basically <laughs> embedded a guy with policy skills to look at what is one of the uh, biggest scandals of the Harris Biden administration with respect to uh, Bureau of Prisons. I mean, it's <laughs> you're the only guy you're the only guy who goes to prison and comes out with a set of policy recommendations. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I mean, I, I think <laughs> they might be going to rethink that by the time I get finished All with right. them. Uh, so but All that's right. a good story. Newmagadeal.com, Amazon, the book. And uh, good luck to your podcast. And um, there it is, brother. All right. Thanks, Peter. I really appreciate you spending time with us. The new MAGA deal, the links are in the bio for anyone who wants to go on Amazon. Check it out. A, a lot more with Peter in that book that really breaks down the policies and his experience. Peter, thanks for being with us. All right, brother. You take care. All right, guys, I hope you like that conversation. New Gingrich is going to be here later in the week, obviously with this VP pick, should she announce it. Prior to the weekend or even over the weekend, we will try to go live as soon as possible to break down what that means. I still think it's going to be Josh Shapiro. Please continue to subscribe on my Substack newsletter. It's free. A lot of interactive information. We do a weekly poll. We get your feedback on a lot of stuff. Go to seanspicer.com. 
Continue to check out my documentary, Trump's Front Row Joes, at SalemNow.com, SalemNow.com. Anyway, we'll be back here tomorrow. Continue to subscribe, YouTube, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.